uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm coming to you from downtown Manhattan. So if you hear any sirens in the background, horns honking, that's just part of the normal day uh, around here. But I suppose good to have the noise and uh, all of that back after the pandemic was so bad, you know, a year and a half ago. Things are getting better, coming back to life. That's, that's the good news. So I want to talk, as I mentioned, about the uh, deployment aspect of cloud native uh, engineering. We heard from Sanjeeva earlier today about the abstractions for development uh, that are so important to make sure that the productive development is productive. But there's, and he touched on this as well about the deployment aspect being very important. And I'm going to dive into that and talk about, you know, what's going on there and what's important to know about and, and how we're going to help with that. And it's all about, you know, improving what we we're just talking about around customer experience uh, at speed and making sure you can iterate through uh, the changes that you need to make to solve the problems that the customers have. And that's a good part of the, the talk, uh, you know, just just uh, just now uh, with Robert about the value uh, to the end user that we need to be focused on and the fact that innovation is all about solving the customer's problem and understanding the customer's problem. And one good way to do that, one modern way to do that is to get something out there uh, like a product, a digital product, get a reaction to see if it's solving the customer's problem, see if it needs to be tweaked a little bit to get a better experience. And Robert mentioned they were working a lot on that with the, the ugly sweater company to you know improve sales by improving the experience. And a good way to do that is get that app out there, get the reaction, change it, iterate, go back, get more feedback and get that continuous feedback iteration deployment loop going. And you notice I said deployment has the key word there. So just a bit about me before we dive in joined WSO2 about a year ago. I spent before that about eight years at Citibank, where I worked in security as architecture at Consumer Bank and as a chief IT architect in Treasury and Trade Solutions Division. Before that, IT architect for Credit Suisse Investment Banking Division. And before that, CTO at Iona Technologies, which is very similar role to what I have now at WSO2. So for me, it's a little bit of back to the future. It was in technology and its CTO role went to banking because one of our big customers was Credit Suisse and Iona was acquired and they uh, basically I made the transition in to the customer and I'm making the transition back to technology and it's great. It's a great time to be doing it with WSO2 being a successful company after six, 16 years and making the pivot to the cloud. So something I worked on quite a bit at Citi was helping with the cloud migration, developing microservices based apps, deploying them on Kubernetes and trying to move also to the public cloud and do it securely, which is where that security angle comes in. And before that, I spent quite a few years at digital equipment, mostly transaction processing and database, and worked on a bunch of industry standards, which is actually where I met Sanjeeva 20 years ago. He's working on the same thing and run web services standards and a couple of books and a patent out there as well. My contact information over here on LinkedIn and Twitter if you want to to follow me there and, and check out what I what I post. All right, so now back to the topic of deployment. So Sanjeeva touched on this a little bit in his talk as well about how at one point a computer was in a room and you went there and you loaded your program and you ran it and you got your results and, and you left. Uh, and it was, you know, sort of it was in that room and you knew where it was and you might have had a data center with a lot of these things in them but that was where they were. And eventually you could connect to them remotely and access your program and run your program uh, remotely as well from terminals and PCs. Um, but this is, uh, you know, this is how it started. It's Univac, one of the first mainframes out there running one of the first commercial applications ever built. And the application was engineered for that system uh, specifically. And of course, over time, systems became more and more commoditized in general purpose and standardized. And now on the left-hand side, we see what cloud native data center looks like. And this is a, a photograph that you can find from any number of cloud native data centers, whether it's being run by Facebook for their, they have their own private cloud or Amazon running a public cloud or Google running a public cloud or Microsoft. It is racks and racks of PC grade, consumer grade hardware stitched together, networked together to provide now the computing capabilities for, uh, that you're familiar with from the leading digital ap uh, applications. The digital experience is important uh, in the cloud, it's very important, 
And in the cloud is how you get that always on feeling, that always connected feeling. You know, your apps are always connected now. Uh, when you bring out your phone, some of the apps don't even work unless there's a network connection. Back in the days of mainframes, that was really unthinkable that you know, something would be connected all the time. And I think we also remember back in the days when websites first came out, the Rolling Stone concert tickets went on sale. Sometimes the website would crash from the extra load. That doesn't happen anymore. We've got extra scale. We've got automatic scale. And perhaps more importantly for our discussion today, we have a case where everything has been automated to the extent that you can make code changes, check them in to the repository, and you'll get, thing, you'll get your code and your app automatically built. And if all the checks pass, all the tests pass, will get automatically deployed out into one of these uh, computers, one or more of these computers, depending how you, you define it. So let's talk a little bit more about this, this kind of sea change in computing from this old scale up sort of mainframe based model where everything was uh, done in a you know, certain, air, a certain sphere of control. You know, Sanjeeva touched on this a bit around about the fallacies of distributed computing. When things became a little more distributed, people wanted to act as if they still were on one machine. Uh, RPCs were supposed to not have any network latency and so on, but they, they do. And I think in the cloud, we've got a bit more focus on distribution, network computing, and adapting a programming model to deal with a lot of these distributed computing challenges that were not really addressed as much when we had the mainframe based or the data center based types of scale up uh, computers. Uh, and then, you know, as we said before, you went to the computer room back in the day, ran the application. The application would stop running once you were done with it. Uh, they weren't on 24 by 7 by 365. That was really a, kind of a more recent concept that the cloud native uh, infrastructures are, have been developed to support. And maybe more, more importantly, or maybe very uh, among, the, uh, among the many important things, perhaps one of the more important, is that in the old model, if you have a machine or a component, significant component of a machine fail, the application is going to stop working. You're not going to have that always on uh, experience. Uh, all of these systems, no matter how big a mainframe that you buy, there's a chance that it's going to fail. And when it fails, it impacts uh, the application. So now we've got the cloud native programs running anywhere. Uh, you can't even get in the computer room. You can't even get in the data center. There's security built up around the entryway when you drive in, around the building. You can see videos, of course, go on YouTube. You can find a lot of videos about Google data centers, Amazon data centers, Facebook data centers, I think, are there. Certainly Microsoft's are there, so you can see them, but you can't get in the room with them. Uh, but and nonetheless, because of these huge data centers that build out of all these hundreds of thousands of servers connected up, things are always there. They're always on. You can always scale to handle the load. And maybe most crucially for the new model of computing, this new type of infrastructure that powers the cloud, if a machine or a significant component of a machine fails, nothing happens. The application keeps going. This is a major, major change in, in the computing capabilities of computing infrastructure. And that has really led to the evolution of, of cloud native deployment. You do have to, though, engineer and think about and create and deploy your applications in the right way to get these benefits. You know, a lot of people do reference this when they talk about moving existing scale up monoliths onto the cloud. You won't get all the benefits that you would get if you decompose those into microservices and are able to update them and deploy them independently and scale them independently and take advantage of cloud native services that support the scaling and the always on, and in particular, keep going even if a computer fails. So great advantages, uh, great steps forward, great help for those digital applications for that customer experience. Uh, and let's talk a little about how this all happened and, 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 and has evolved. So first, I think we had the concept of running applications in the cloud. Uh, I think this was pioneered by uh, Amazon for their website and Netflix when they made the transition from monolith to microservices, break up the application functions into microservices with strict interface control. One example uh, is the pay now button on the Amazon website. This is a microservice backed by a small team and they can independently iterate, update the code for the pay now button anytime they want, 
push the change out anytime they want without worrying about any of the other changes to any other functions on the Amazon web page. They can do this because the interfaces are strictly controlled. So the interface between the pay function, function uh, single click function button and other payment functions in the Amazon Web Services website, sorry, on the Amazon website are not impacted because the interfaces are, are not changing. So uh, there's a lot of techniques around here, and a lot of best practices, but breaking up the app into microservices and having the app functions be implemented by microservices supported by my teams dedicated to those microservices provides a lot of benefit and helps quite a bit in improving the customer experience because you can put these changes out independently and improve that particular aspect of the application independently and continue to go. Of course, for smaller apps, what it means is you can get the customer feedback more quickly and change and iterate and improve more quickly at the speed the customers come to expect by taking advantage of these particular capabilities of cloud native infrastructure and how applications have been built up uh, over the over a few years to take advantage of those things. So we had the, the microservices breakthrough, which is huge uh, breakthrough in terms of how to rapidly iterate and isolate change and be able to push changes to production with automated uh, pipelines. And we had standardization of Docker containers to be able to run a microservice on any computer so that you can just create your code, wrap it into a, a Docker file and put it onto one of these computers anywhere it, it runs. And then finally, the final piece of the, the this kind of deployment puzzle has been the standardization of Kubernetes as the Docker container, as the container orchestration mechanism that everybody has adopted. And this gives the developers a capability of creating their microservices, wrapping them in Docker files and giving a configuration file off to the Kubernetes cluster and deploying one or more copies of those microservices out into those cloud native data centers uh, automatically. And of course, uh, development ops, everything has to be automated uh, for this to work, but we have all this, this capabilities uh, available now uh, to automate the process of improving applications and improving that customer experience at the speed they, they expect and at the speed that you need to do it to remain competitive. So the analogy for automation here and the sea change, I guess you could say is containers. Containers as a shipping standard, of course, that I think everyone's familiar with is containers go on trucks, they go on ships, they go on trains. And you have the uh, Kubernetes analogy of the crane here that's taking the containers and loading them into the ship or the truck or the, or the train. And that's the sort of the analogy for, you know, we've got our code wrapped up into a standard packaging unit that can be deployed with a standard mechanism. Just as a kind of an interesting side note, you can get a data center in a container, so you can run your containers in a container if, if, if you want to. Computer companies do sell pre-built data centers in containers. Okay, so just back to back to the point here. Kubernetes is how uh, you do the container orchestration. Very simple setup. You have your containers, you have Kubernetes pods in the Kubernetes clusters, and you have the Kubernetes control plane taking the config file from the developers and deciding how many containers to run and how many pods and where to run them. So this is now how that applications get deployed in those data centers. And you don't have to worry about where it goes because you couldn't even figure it out if you wanted to where the computer was and how to deploy things manually. So this is a, a great automated system for getting those microservices wrapped in containers or other apps wrapped in containers and pushed out there and controlling them. There's a container runtime that helps with making sure that the containers have the right resources available in the Kubernetes pods, that networking is done correctly, troubleshooting is done correctly, everything is healthy and active and available as it needs to be. Very easy system, right? What could go wrong? Well, here's the trouble with, uh, with Kubernetes, setting up the cluster, administering the cluster, and in particularly troubleshooting the cluster. Here's the diagram from the Kubernetes website that shows you all the steps you have to go through if you're a Kubernetes uh, system admin trying to figure out what might have gone wrong with a cluster when something goes wrong with the cluster. A lot of complexity. 
Okay, so we have this great benefit of Kubernetes as the standard deployment platform to orchestrate the containers across those hundreds of thousands of consumer grade PCs in your data center to make sure everything is always on and uh, always running and always available and scalable and all of that. But setting all that up uh, for the handoff from developers who are trying to create microservices and containers and other code and APIs, integrations, and hand it off for deployment to Kubernetes, uh, now you've got this situation where do developers, if developers have to worry about this, it can be, can be uh, an impediment. So now, though, we can assume that Kubernetes is there uh, because it just is. We can look at all of the, class. <laughs> well, the, the evidence is that it, you can see it's there because all of the cloud native providers, public cloud providers provide Kubernetes. AWS has the version, Google, Azure, Oracle, and there are plenty of on-prem Kubernetes options available through OpenShift and Nomad and Rancher. So pretty much the standardization of Kubernetes as a container orchestration uh, capability <coughs> means that Kubernetes is always going to be there as a deployment uh, option. And we can start to abstract this away and work a level up by creating a platform on top of Kubernetes for, for sort of abstracting the things that you want to do, whether on multi-cloud and multi-cluster, config management, identity access management, CICD, storage, monitoring, logging, uh, access and uh, catalogs of, of, uh, of config files. So we can always assume, because we can always assume Kubernetes is going to be there for deployment, we can start working at the next level and put platforms on top of Kubernetes. And for example, this is what we're doing with our new uh, Corio product by WSO2, which is in beta now, provides a Kubernetes-based platform for APIs, integrations, and services. Sanjeeva covered the uh, dev part of this pretty well, talking about the ballerina code syntax and the low code environments for drawings uh, and pictures and no code templates that also generate code, all of which goes into the GitHub for automated build, test and deploy, and with APIs published and consumed. So this is, this is the platform we're building on top of Kubernetes because we can assume it's always going to be there because we know what the cloud native programming model is, go is, is going to be, is it, what the cloud native programming model is. And we can abstract with the right abstractions, create productivity on the development side, but we can also create a lot of productivity on the ops side by creating one click, one click of a button deployment for the API services and integrations, creating with those development abstractions. So we're working on both sides of this, create a tremendously pro uh, beneficial set of productivity tools for development and deployment for cloud native apps that you need to to build and deploy to support the customer experience of those digital apps you're working on platform also includes uh, as sanjeeva mentioned a lot of this about the observability to see how everything's running correctly ai to help you build the right thing in the first place and security because of course in the cloud on zero trust it is very very important and this, this picture overlays the capabilities that we're talking about on the Corio platform, creating APIs, integrations, services, and deploying them out through uh, GitHub, triggering DevOps and GitOps pipelines and configurations, deploying it to Kubernetes, and publishing and consuming from the API marketplace for integration with other systems. So uh, in, in uh, kind of a summary here, what we want to say is we're looking at what's needed for companies and consumers and organizations looking to improve the customer experience of their digital apps through iterative development and deployment. We abstract the development part through the syntax of Ballerina and the low-code diagrams and no-code templates of Corio to make it very easy for a wide range of developers to work with the tool, whether they want to work in the full code and the low code or the no code and help get the ar these artifacts, these APIs, integrations and services developed very quickly and with a high quality because of the observability and the AI assistance we provide. And at the same time, uh, be able to give it all the, give, deliver all the benefits of the cloud native computing through the deployment abstractions as well. So we've got the full code 
ability, the low code, no code abstractions, and the ability to automatically build and deploy these APIs, integrations, and services into the cloud. Uh, right now, we're developing and deploying all of this on Azure and using the Azure Kubernetes. And over time, we're going to be supporting more and more flavors of Kubernetes through the ability to abstract Kubernetes that's given, that abstract away the Kubernetes complexity that's given to us that we're that we are uh, making taking advantage of in the de in the deployment uh, in the development area abstracting that development means abstracting the deployment as well we can also do that with syntax in the language so we spend more time on innovation less time on plumbing we will be in integrating our also our cloud version of identity server called sgardia which is also in beta right now this will be integrated with Corio to provide strong security. So we're going to provide the development capabilities for the APIs, integrations, and services, and security for those APIs, integrations, and services through identity access management from Asgardio, also running in the cloud, also abstracted uh, for Kubernetes uh, deployment. So we're working and on the ability to deliver in the cloud, on-prem, and hybrid as well, uh, we still are going to support on-prem deployments, on-prem APIs, on-prem integrations, cloud-based uh, APIs, cloud-based integration services, connect them all up seamlessly, run them in parallel. Hybrid world is going to be here for the foreseeable future. So we're building up the capabilities for cloud native, but we're still emphasizing and maintaining to, and continuing to invest in the on-prem uh, products that we have been delivering and been successful with for the last 16 years. We are adding on the uh, cloud native capabilities as a complementary set of capabilities to the capabilities we have on the on-prem products, all of which are going to work together and allow you to move into the cloud uh, as you need to, as it makes sense to do, as it makes sense to invest in that, in that evolution. Primarily, the new products are aimed at helping with new development for digitization, uh, but of course, we're going to make sure Everything works seamlessly with the on-prem products uh, as well. <clears throat> and just to briefly on, on Capital One example, I, I think maybe uh, most people are familiar with this by now, but if not, just briefly, Capital One announced earlier this year that they've moved their entire data centers into AWS. They have no more on-prem uh, data centers anymore at all. And they list in the case studies that they've published the benefits of this, including the digitization, the improving customer experience at speed through microservices, through the advantages of the cloud. Um, that of course, they had to invest in this and it took four years for them to do this. And I think what we are seeing is the evolution of cloud native infrastructure of the, of the uh, abstraction of development and the, and the ability to assume now that deployment is going to go through Kubernetes and Docker, that we can cut that time to months instead of years that it took before these innovations were, were available. So I want to announce also, as, uh, as Greg mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to start a new program to help migrate workloads to the cloud and provide a SaaS experience. So this will be very much to help you figure out, you know, as a customer, which workloads you want to have or an organization which workloads you want to have in the cloud, which ones you want to have on-prem. Uh, if you want to run everything in the cloud, we'll help with that. If you want to continue to run some things on-prem and some things in the cloud, we'll help with that. And we'll, we'll help you get toward a much more of a software as a service uh, environment and help you get the benefits of the cloud that realize the benefits of the cloud that you need for those digital applications and that all important customer experience that we were talking about earlier. Uh, and we got a new program to help with that. So we also have uh, as a wrap up slide here, we have the uh, WSO2.com slash cloud migration webpage to take a look at. They'll give full details of this offering. Uh, and of course, if you need, if you, if you need more information, go to the webpage or you can contact us and we can give you a, a hand understanding, first of all, what's on offer here. And second of all, uh, implementing it and, uh, and carrying it, carrying it out. So I think with that, um, I am uh, done with uh, with my presentation. So.